welcome to a sample of readings by the writers who gathered for Stories We Wear, an East Side Freedom Library creative writing and discussion workshop held on June 11th, 2022, and designed to invite solidarity with the people who make our clothes. The workshop was created and facilitated by me, Alison Morse. On a Saturday morning at the library, the participants who signed up for Stories We Wear listened to poems and also read poems out loud based on the lives and words of women who were involved in two historic events for garment workers, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire in New York City in 1911 and the Rana Plaza collapse in Savar, Bangladesh that occurred in 2013. We also discussed the current economic and health crises in garment factories globally, from Dhaka to Los Angeles, crises that have spurred renewed activism around the world, led by garment workers themselves, local and international unions, garment worker centers, and other NGOs. Not everyone who participated in Stories We Wear called themselves a writer but all the participants brainstormed and wrote drafts of poems or personal stories about clothing they wear or wore. They also imagined the lives of the people who made those clothes and the lives of the clothes themselves. Here's a sample of readings by the participants who wanted their words recorded. Hello everyone, my name is Catherine Grimm. Um, I wrote this story about my Harding band sweater that I wear often, and it's called Journey of My Harding Sweater. Her callous, delicate hands tied the last knot, then packed the maroon sweater glinting from the Honduran sun in the last box. Destination, Jersey's factory in Ohio. As the truck pulled out of the Honduran factory, as the blood red sun set, she sighed. Her hands and body ached, but she knew that she had to sew to survive. She would be there the next day. The box jostled around on the back of a white prim truck headed north through the vastness of Mexico City and through the Sinaloa Desert until it reached the mile long line of the US-Mexico border. The sweater sitting in the box among the thousands of faceless, nameless sweaters that were hand stitched by the Honduran mothers that week passed into the land of the free and home of the consumption happy citizenry. In a blink of an eye, the box of hand stitched sweaters by the Honduran mothers made its way to the factory where that box of nameless, faceless sweaters was thrown against the, uh, thrown against the wall waiting for that order, which came on October 2015. The day finally came, the lid was open and the sweater, hand stitched by the Honduran mother, was thrown haphazardly into the machine and came out on the other side with Harding band. Perfect, said the man, not realizing the work, labor and pain the Honduran mother went through to make that sweater. This sweater that now has a name was folded into another box with care and put on another truck, this time headed to St. Paul, Minnesota. The lid was open and the sweaters were passed around with glee and excitement and the label side, understanding that the high schoolers could never understand the blood, sweat and tears the Honduran mothers endured to make their sweaters. They could never understand. Thank you. up from the dank floorboards and crumbled walls were the blood, sweat, and tears of Meta's past. 
That mix of open fires, cramped quarters with her sisters gathered around and the aged sweat made for a pungent memory. When Meta and her friends left the small village to work at the factory, they thought of money flowing from their labor. The resignation though, that school only lived on in memory and possibilities for their future lives as wives and mothers. Would made to have children? Fast forward and her early love Mohammed died in the fire, leaving her transition from childhood to adulthood in scattered pieces along those floorboards. She was only a child herself when the factory man came to her parents and assured them of the opportunities to bring honor to her family. And of course, the rupees were appealing. Maida and her friends toiled under the burning sun, but so did her family who tended the soil back home, yet were tired from years of dashed hopes and poor crops. Maida could be the future in that factory. She'd be safe, the factory man said, her honor protected in the devious smile that he as he glanced at her. At 13 years old, Maida's life would forever change. Dreams dashed, routines scattered to the wind. Hello, my name is Kate Shaughnessy and this is my poem entitled Horizontal Stripes. Faded pastels on a summer top beckoned to my 12 year old self. It was for that big trip to California to adventure first beyond the Minnesota Plains. That gray slow spring creeped along for days asking for reprieve. An adventure to the west awaited, yet the stripes of that top went in the wrong direction, she said. Quizzically and sadly, the blouse was not to be mine. The stripes went in the wrong direction, she said. They must be vertical, she said, to elongate your appearance. Your tall, slender sister can wear horizontal, but not you. I must look to the horizon, but never wear it. I'm Cindy Vivoda, and this is my story. I cried and wore the dress. I was four years old at my oldest sister's wedding. I was to wear a frilly yellow puffy dress, but I wanted to wear a smart blazer or tuxedo like my older brothers. I sobbed unconsolably throughout the whole day's affair. And in the family wedding portrait, my eyes are red and moist, my cheeks tear stained, my face depicting agony and deep sorrow. My name is Cindy Vaivoda. I attended the writer's workshop at Eastside Freedom Library and I wrote some stuff about my mother during that workshop. And then I came home and I asked her questions to fill in the story. And so now she's gonna read the story to you. Her name is Edith. Slow Fashion by Edith Vaivoda. When I was a child growing up in the 1930s, my mother made most of our clothes for me and my nine brothers and sisters on a foot throttle powered Singer sewing machine that she inherited from her mother-in-law. She made diapers by cutting and hemming yards of soft cotton bird's eye material she could buy from the local general store. She made the big kids summer underwear from repurposed flower sacks. All babies wore dresses until they were three or four years old, old enough to use the outhouse on their own. After that, the boys got to wear store-bought bib overalls 
And the girls, of course, continued to wear dresses handmade by mother. She had a drawer full of saved used tissue paper patterns of all sizes that let her know exactly how much material she would need. Late every summer, she would go all the way to St. Cloud to purchase the arts of cotton fabric she needed to make our brand new school clothes, school dresses for that year. She would complete a dress in a day if she was not disturbed too much by cooking, canning, gardening, laundry, and child care for 10. The first day of school, we could all walk proudly into the schoolhouse in our brand new dresses. The same dress we would wear every day for that school year. It might be a little loose in September, but by May, knees were peeking out where they oughtn't to be. It was important to take good care of our dress to make it last. Every day after school, we would hang our school dresses on the nail in the wall of our bedroom that we shared. Our school dresses only could be washed during school vacation, like Christmas, and so that they would have time to dry before they were needed again. Our other clothes had to last too. Mother darned our socks when they got holes in their heels and patched the knees of the overalls to make any other emergency alterations. When something got too threadbare to repair, it was placed in the rag bag. In her spare time, mother cut the worn rag bag material into narrow strips and sewed them end to end, and then rolled them along the lines into colorful watermelon sized balls that daddy used in his loom to weave the rugs that covered the floor of every room of the house. The extra bits of fiber fabric from the dresses never got wasted either. Every small scrap was made into quilts for our need to keep warm in winter. When summer came, last year's school dress became this summer's everyday wear for the next child younger. We had chore clothes for particularly dirty jobs like cleaning the pig pen my father's World War I army jacket hung on a hook near the kitchen door to be slipped into over everything to wear to keep clean while doing these chores. Most of, the, uh, most of our schoolmates lived as we did and one, with one set of school clothes and one set of hand-me-downs for every day. A few wealthier town families wore different store-bought clothes every day, but it never caused a disturbance because they had known us all our lives and we were friends. At the end of the workshop, the group collaborated on this poem based on their favorite lines from their own writing. They gave me permission to read the poem. Let no one. I'm going to look at the horizon, but not wear it. Let no one diminish the dignity. Her hands and body ached, but she knew she needed to sew to survive. 
the dignity of labor. Sweatshops are targeting more women now, diminishes the dignity. Slavery outsourced diminishes the dignity. Three hours of work and 300 t-shirts distributed. Who needs another free t-shirt diminishes the dignity. Why had I forgotten the Rana Plaza collapse? Let no one diminish the dignity of labor. <laughs>